each of each of the community members commitment um, to stay engaged and participate in this process because we all know um, that through your participation and engagement um, the results of the work that's being performed are def will definitely be improved. Again, my role is to keep us on track, on time. Um, I will review later in the meeting uh, some meeting ground rules, and it's my role to ensure that we observe those, as well as to provide an opportunity for as many of you to ask as many questions as possible related to the topics tonight. And we have a number of staff members from Valley Water also um, involved in this, in this meeting tonight that will be available to respond to your questions. So a couple of housekeeping um, um, steps that, that we're gonna take now before we jump into the welcome and into the formal presentations. I'd like to introduce our translators. And for this meeting, um, I would like to invite our, our Spanish translator to introduce herself. Hola, buenas noches. Yo soy Ana Vidales y Jordi Vidales. Vamos a estarles interpretando esta noche al español. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite our Vietnamese translator to introduce themselves. Uh, tôi tên là Tiffany, tôi là người thông dịch viên của tiếng Việt Nam ngày hôm nay. Xin chào tất cả các quý ông bà tới tham dự cuộc họp ngày hôm nay. And my name is Tiffany. I'm the interpreter for the meeting today. Great. Thank you very much. Next, so that you all have the opportunity to access all the functions of this Zoom virtual public meeting, I want to introduce Albert Lee. He's a staff member with Valley Water, and he's going to provide some instructions on how to access the interpretation, language interpretation services, how to use the tools, and then he's also going to show you how to join the meeting. Um, once we conclude the presentations in the second hour, so you can share questions with Valley Water staff. Albert? Right, thank, thank you, Christine. So once we finish this slide, I will be enabling the interpretation function on Zoom. So uh, just for your awareness, there is an interpretation uh, button on Zoom. Uh, for Spanish, you'll be able to select Spanish once I enable it. For Vietnamese, you'll have to select the Portuguese option. Zoom currently does not list Vietnamese as an option. We are working with Zoom to enable that option, and we hope that they will add that language in the future. Uh, so again, if, if you're a Vietnamese speaker, you will be selecting Portuguese, so you have the Vietnamese channel. If you will also be hearing the original audio, if you find that distracting, please mute original audio so you hear only the language of your, your comfort. Uh, what we'll do now is have uh, Anna and Tiffany describe what I just mentioned in the languages. So Tiffany, go ahead first. Actually, Anna, if you're ready, we'll just have go you uh, first to describe the Spanish uh, function. Sí, buenas tardes. Entonces, para las personas que quieran escuchar la traducción o la interpretación en el español, entonces en la parte baja ustedes van a ver como una especie de globito. Entonces, usted lo único que tienen que hacer es dar clic en ese globito y buscar la opción en español para poder utilizar, para poder escuchar la interpretación. All right, Tiffany, if you're ready, can you also uh, provide the brief description in Vietnamese? Yeah. Uh, để cho cái cuộc họp ngày hôm nay chúng tôi sẽ có uh, thông dịch viên và quý vị có thể lựa cái uh, channel uh, vì ở trong cái phần uh, cuộc uh, cái uh, uh, cuộc video này nó không có cái tiếng uh, Việt Nam thành thử là các ông bà cần phải chọn chữ tên là Portuguese thì uh, các ông bà mới có thể nghe được uh, tiếng Việt Nam ạ. À. Right, thank you both. Right now I will be enabling the interpretation options for you and please select the correct channel of your choice. All right, go ahead and move on to the next slide, uh, Christine. All right, for those who have joined us, uh, you should be hearing uh, the audio channels now. I'll give you a moment to select the correct languages. For those who are joining us, this is a listen-only webinar. You will have an opportunity to ask questions later on. If you feel like you're having issues listening or getting a stable internet connection with audio, you can also call in by using the number on the screen and the meeting ID that was listed on the website and also some of your invitations. All right, move on to the next slide. There will be an opportunity to ask questions. You can ask your questions through the Q&A portal of the, the toolbar. The toolbar is enabled when you move your mouse around. 
can also raise your hand and ask your question verbally. Once you raise your hand, I will enable your mic and you will unmute yourself. You can ask your question in English or in the language of your comfort. If you ask your question in Spanish or in Vietnamese, uh, ask it in your language and an interpreter will repeat your question in English for our um, staff to answer. Alternatively, you can also send your message via chat. Um, again, if we enable your mic after you raise your hand, we will call your name out. We will uh, ask you to unmute yourself and you can verbally ask your question. Uh, that's it for me uh, and back to you, Christine. Thank you, Albert. Now I would like to introduce Director Richard P. Santos. Director Santos is a native of El Viso. He served in Korea while in the army. He retired as a San Jose fire captain after 33 years of service. Director Santos was elected to Valley Waters Board of Directors in 2000, and he represents District 3, and that includes Sunnyvale, Santa Clara, El Viso, Milpitas, Berryessa, and Alam, Park, and Alam Rock communities. Now Director Santos will provide a welcome on behalf of the Board of Directors. Welcome everybody, and Christine, can you hear me? I sure can. Thank you very much. Good. Yeah, thank you all. Unfortunately, I have some technology problems. We had the trial run and I was can see everybody. Now I'm looking at a blank screen, but I wanna welcome everybody and thank you uh, to all the participants to join in us tonight. Uh, with all the turmoil that's going on and C19 and all those things, but tonight we wanna hope we can bring some benefits to you all and we need your participation. Usually my preference is to be in the community with you where we can have these important project discussions and answer your questions. But the current public health crisis has changed our approach to engaging with the community in order to help keep us all safe. Thankfully, this Zoom event allows us to do so while continuing to practice social distance, distancing, being able to connect with you remotely, especially during these challenging times, reinforces our commitment to providing you meaningful project information and addressing your concerns. I don't have a list of folks that are there tonight in terms of elected officials and their representative. So if the staff is there and you know, could you please uh, introduce them and I'll continue after you introduce who may be there alive on the screen. Does anybody have some folks there? Director Santos, we have Carrie Duncan from Congresswoman Zoe Loughran's office in attendance. Thank you, go ahead. Anyone else please? Is there anyone else, Rachel? Uh, my apologies, Director Santos. Nope, that's it for tonight. Okay, well, we thank you uh, from Zoe Locker's representation. Uh, you know, she's been very, very helpful with Anderson Dam in the Coyote Creek, and so we're looking forward to continuing that relationship. I would like to share my personal story of having been flooded three times in my life while living in Alviso. Uh, that experiences, influences my work at the Valley Water and reinforces my goal of ensuring that we keep the community safe through our flood protection programs. This project exemplifies that effort. When I was a young uh, fellow in 1956, way before your time, in 1958, I was a, a young person and I lost everything we owned. And then in 1983, I was in the fire department, lost my home, my family, and I had to help evacuate Alviso. So we've been through it. I share that, that pain and suffering, and we don't want to see that happen again to anybody. I've lived it, and I'm here today, and I want to make sure that it doesn't happen to you folks. So thank you. We've heard from many people in the community over the last few months regarding Anderson Dam Seismic Retrofit Project, especially with the news regarding the directive from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or the acronym called FERC, F-E-R-C. FERC directed us to begin dewatering Anderson Reservoir by October 1st of 2020. Tonight, we're going to hear about the timeline and the coordination with the Coyote Creek Flood Project Protection Project. I have confidence in our staff and our partners at the local and state and federal level that the project will be completed in a manner that delivers on what we said we would, which is to provide improved flood protection in this community. These projects are a high priority for the Valley Water Board and represent our commitment to supporting both public health and public safety in our communities. My board colleagues and I continue to vigorously 
advocate with our state and federal representatives to secure funding for these important water supply flood project protection projects. Their investment is critical to achieving flood protection projects for our communities. We are monitoring discussions at the federal level on the potential availability of stimulus funding for public works projects that are already for construction. You can be assured we are ready to act quickly to get our share of funding for vital public safety projects. Tonight, we want your input, feedback on Coyote Creek, recommended project alternatives. Again, we feel free to ask questions and share your thoughts with us. We have staff at various divisions of the Valley Water available to respond during the question and answer portion of tonight's virtual meeting. I wanna thank you all for listening and participating. And our staff is there to help. And anytime you need to get a hold of me, my phone number is there, 408-234-7707-724, give me a call. We want to bring confidence and hope to people. So Christine, back to you and thank you all. Thank you so much, Director Santos. I just wanted to um, thank all of the members of the public that are participating in tonight's meeting. It looks like we have 30 members of the public. In addition, uh, we have several members of, other members of the Valley Water Board. Um, that includes Director Barbara Keegan, Linda Lizotti, and um, I believe that uh, Director um, Estramera is also um, with us this evening, and he's the Vice Chair of the Valley Water Board. So thank you so much, all of you, for participating in this evening's meeting. I'd like to cover a couple of logistics before we move into the formal presentations. First, the purpose of tonight's meeting is really to provide an update to the community on the status of the Anderson Dam Seismic Retrofit Project. The focus of tonight's discussion is clearly the Coyote Creek Flood Protection Project recommended alternatives. You will also have the opportunity to be introduced to the Coyote Creek Flood Protection Project design project team. And then the second half of the meeting, in, when we get past the seven o'clock hour, we will open the floor to you um, to afford you the opportunity to ask questions. And again, we have staff available to respond to those questions. We're really looking forward to hearing from you. In addition, Valley Water has a, you know, maintained a frequently asked questions list for both of these projects. And certainly the questions that you ask this evening will inform and enhance and likely um, modify that list um, so that there's good public information for those that are interested in these projects. So our agenda, we had our welcome. Thank you again, Director Santos, for your comments. And, um, the passionate stories you told about your own personal experience um, being flooded um, in the past. It certainly is a challenge. Next, we'll hear from staff on the Anderson Dam Seismic Retrofit Project. That'll be about 15 minutes, about a 20 minute presentation from two members of the Coyote Creek Flood Protection Project team. And then we'll spend about 45 minutes opening the floor for questions and then a brief wrap up. So uh, logistics for this evening, this meeting is being recorded and it will be posted at the Valley Waters website. So if you'd like to view it at another time, you certainly can. You're also welcome to view the recordings of the meetings on June 11th and June 17th. Questions for this meeting will follow the two staff presentations. So we ask you to jot them down on a piece of paper and hang on to them. And once we open the floor uh, to questions, you can submit them through the Q&A portal on Zoom. You're welcome to virtually raise your hand and pose your question verbally. The meeting is also being telecast on Facebook. And if individuals are interested in posing questions on Facebook, Valley Water staff will submit through, through the, excuse me, submit those through the Q&A portal. Um, so they'll be available for us to view, um, read, and then provide opportunities for staff to provide responses. And again, the frequently asked questions are available at Valley Waters website. And for all project information, we encourage you um, to visit uh, Valley Waters website, www.valleywater.org backslash coyote hyphen creek. 
thank you for participating and thank you in advance for your patience in joining this uh, virtual meeting. And I'm going to share the ground rules. We'll review these again uh, once we open the floor for questions. But we're going to invite you to listen with an open mind, submit your questions to participate, be curious, assume good intent, use productive and respectful language, be brief, concise to ensure all interested parties can participate, and also invite you to focus really on the topics of tonight's presentation. And please refer any questions related to any ongoing litigation to your respective lethal counsel. So now I'd like to introduce Chris Hakes, the Deputy Operating Officer of Dam Safety and Capital Delivery Division. He's going to provide an update on the Anderson Dam Seismic Retrofit Project. Thank you, Chris. Um, while I pull up my um, presentation here, just some quick, um, some quick kind of differentiation on what we're talking about tonight. Although my update is on the Anderson Dam Seismic Retrofit Project, what I'll actually be talking about, as Director Santos mentioned, is the February 20th directive from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, um, and what we're calling the FERC Order Compliance Project. Um, as a result of the project, we will be draining the reservoir, and I'll go through this in detail in the slides that follow, uh, and installing an outlet tunnel. That outlet tunnel will be capable of discharging additional flows to Coyote Creek. So as part of this, to ensure that we don't induce flooding, there are what we call flood protection mitigation measures associated with this project. Um, those measures just happen to be some of the measures that had previously been identified during the Coyote Creek Flood Protection Project, but these measures are actually directly related to the FERC Order Compliance Project. Um, they have what we call independent utility. Um, this project is a separate project from both the Seismic Retrofit Project and the Coyote Flood Protection Project. It's just kind of an amalgamation of several different efforts that the uh, Valley Water had been undertaking for a while now. As that's the case, um, my preamble is over and I'll go ahead and start the slideshow. So um, a while back, the Valley Water Board of Directors codified the project goals for Anderson Dam. I'm not gonna read it verbatim, but basically we have four main goals, public safety. Obviously we wanna protect the public from a catastrophic failure of Anderson Dam in the event of a seismic, uh, um, seismic issue or event. Water supply, we want to make sure that the, the county has all of the water supply it needs through the Anderson Dam uh, Seismic Retrofit Project, so we'll be able to improve the amount of water we store there. Environmental enhancements, uh, as it, that is one of the missions of um, the Valley Water is environmental stewardship. We want to make sure the actions we take are not damaging to the environment for all uh, intensive purposes and hopefully bettering the environment. And then we want to do all those things in a financially sustainable manner. Um, you know, we're looking at cost-effective solutions to ensure all of these goals are met. This is the existing Anderson Dam. Um, as you can see, we have a spillway uh, up on the kind of upper left portion of the page. Um, you have your dam embankment, which is where the dam crest goes, the road over it. Um, you've got a small outlet pipe that actually runs directly under the dam embankment, um, and then the dam embankment itself. Um, the next slide will show you what the complete seismic retrofit project does. Um, so, we'll be removing all of the uh, embankment material that could possibly slump during an earthquake. Um, slump means kind of sink down. So basically we looked at the, the uh, analysis and in 2016 we discovered there's a lot of material on the dam embankment that would slump during a seismic event. So we're gonna be removing that in its entirety and replacing it with suitable material. We will be leaving the clay core intact, um, but that's kind of a semantic um, argument. Basically, you're going to get a brand new dam in the same location. Uh, we'll be replacing the spillway its entirety. Uh, when we first started designing the project, it was just going to be a repair, um, kind of patch and repair. Uh, then 2017 happened with the torrential rains that damaged the Orville spillway and the uh, California Department of Water Resources Department of Safety of Dams, who's our state agency that um, is in control of the dam, um, revise their criteria and as a result we'll be replacing the spillway in its entirety. We'll be constructing a new low-level outlet pipe. That's to replace the existing outlet pipe that runs directly under the center of the dam. Um, that's because in a seismic event there's potentially four feet of movement that could occur. Um, that tiny little outlet that currently exists is right under the center so if we move four feet we break it 
or damage it in some capacity, this new low level outlet pipe will be installed in a tunnel so that it'll have sufficient room to move. Um, and as a result, it will be a lot more resilient during a seismic event. We will be putting a temporary diversion system in to dewater the reservoir. So after uh, the FERC order compliance project is completed, uh, we would do a, a complete draining of the reservoir, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then we actually have to install what we call a high level outlet pipe as well. This is to comply with DSOD, Department of Safety Advanced Regulations, that says we need to be able to drain about 30% of the water in the reservoir in about seven days. And that's through that new upper level outlet. Let's talk about what FERC told us to do on February 20th, 2020. Um, so they said immediately we were to lower our restricted level for operating of the reservoir. Currently, when we received the letter on February 25th, the restricted level was 592 feet. Um, the new lower elevation that they said we needed to immediately comply with was 565 feet. Since we were uh, in our winter operations mode, we were already below that. We were about 552 feet, so we were in immediate compliance, no issues there. Um, the next step was we were to take all necessary measures to drain down to elevation 488. Um, that's what we affectionately call Deadpool. Uh, the reason it's called Deadpool is because we cannot drain it through the existing mechanical means that we currently have in place. So the water is dead in place. Um, in addition, although uh, there is water in the uh, reservoir, uh, it's not really moving anywhere. So it gets kind of hot, the dissolved oxygen drops and life becomes very difficult to sustain in the pool of water. Another reason it's called dead pool. So we're gonna start that activity uh, to begin to drain from the elevation we're currently at down to dead pool on October 1st. Um, they also required us to develop a plan to help maintain that elevation in the event of significant rains. You've heard me mention the existing outlet a, a few times already. It's very small. It can only transmit about 500 CFS to Coyote Creek. Uh, when we have large inflows coming, that's like a drop in the bucket. Um, the upper watershed can yield somewhere between 10 and 12,000 cubic feet per second in a, a major event. So 500 just isn't cutting it. And our new system will take care of that. But in the immediacy, FERC has told us to look for a way to maintain 488 to the best of our ability. In order to do that long term, they would like us to expedite design and construction of the new outlet tunnel. Um, so that's what we will be doing uh, moving forward and we'll start construction in 2021. I'll see that in a little, uh, a little uh, head in the slides. Uh, and that will give us the ability to discharge up to five times as much water as we can now. So that will help us maintain the reservoir level under the restricted level. And then the last thing, they want us to complete the overall seismic retrofit project. Um, even though they have these interim measures in place to ensure public safety, they realize that these are just a start and the overall project needs to be completed to fully address the seismic issues. So here was our response. We were immediately in compliance with the new reservoir level restriction. Um, we created a project called the Anderson Dam Tunnel Project, which is a portion of the FERC order compliance project, and that is to expedite design and construction of the outlet tunnel. We created the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission Order Compliance Project. Long title, that's why we like to call it the FOCP, uh, and that's to safely drain and, and maintain the lowest practical reservoir operating level while minimizing water supply and environmental impacts. And what that means is after we take that water out, this project basically is how do we take the water out? How do we make sure the environment isn't damaged? How do we make sure that you have water for the community? And basically, how do we get the tunnel in? Those are all the different components that are in there right now. And on, um, I believe it was just uh, May 26th, our board of directors approved the preliminary project description. And that basically uh, tells you what's in the FOCP. There's about 10 separate elements over four areas that are covered there. Um, and so basically the mitigation measures required on Coyote Creek for flood protection are one of those elements, which is why we're telling you about them tonight. So here's a pictorial of what I just covered. Um, basically you see that our elevation of our um, Dam crest right now is 647 feet. Our existing elevation uh, for restriction, which is not on there, is 592. Uh, we were imme immediately restricted to 565, uh, which we were at. And then, of course, we have to lower it to elevation 488. So beginning on October 1st, we'll begin draining to elevation 488. And we have um, generated a dewatering plan, what we like to call a drawdown plan, to accomplish that. The second kind of large component is installation of the temporary diversion. 
um, or the, the, the low level outlet tunnel. So we have submitted a plan to FERC on how to get that done, not construction plans, but basically a schedule and plan for when that will happen. Um, it shows that we will begin construction in early 2021. Construction for the tunnel itself will take 18 to 24 months. And we expect that uh, you know, operation will it'll be operable at the end of 2023. Uh, the other measures that we have identified that are pertinent to this meeting to actually draw down safely are we do have to provide the downstream flood protection mitigation elements on Coyote Creek. Um, so that's the limited elements that are part of the FOCP. Uh, we do need to look at the embankment and outlet when we drain. We want to drain in a very controlled fashion to make sure that we don't have any damage to our outlet because that would be uh, unfortunate to say the least. And then we have to enact any necessary mitigation measures to um, minimize the impacts to water supply and the environment. Um, part of the reason, and you probably heard me say this last time if you were um, getting the update on the Anderson Dam project, is there are a ton of permits involved in this. We have 13 different agencies that we deal with, um, and these are a list of a lot of the permits that we have to um, actually get for the project. Uh, for the FERC order compliance project, um, it is an emergency. So basically a lot of these things are being expedited. We're going into expedited consultation under emergency action. Um, so basically all of these will be moving a lot faster than they would just normally, which is a good thing. Here's what we project the project schedule to look like. As you can see at the top, you have the Anderson Dam Tunnel Project. It's actually going to construction in the beginning of 21. If you remember my last update, the Anderson Dam seismic retrofit was supposed to go to construction late fall of 2022. Um, so we basically picked up a year and started the project early. Um, what we don't know right now is whether we can shorten the duration of the Anderson Dam seismic retrofit project. The tunnel construction is actually the first two years of the original plan for the seismic retrofit project. Even though this is an independent project, we're going to be able to jump off of this um, to hopefully gain some momentum into the full seismic retrofit. Right now, we're assuming that there will be a section where we'll have to keep it drained per the FERC order, um, prepare the site, and then do the construction. We are trying to compress this schedule. Um, there is the ability to roll right after the construction is done into the construction of the seismic retrofit project. That would hopefully shave a year off. Um, and you know the part where we're drained to Deadpool, once the outlet tunnel is in, FERC may reconsider their order and allow us to put more water in. That might help to in, uh, minimize environmental impact, but it might lengthen out the schedule. So I would focus, if I were you, on the Anderson Dam Tunnel Project schedule because that's the one we know. Uh, everything on the seismic retrofit project will need to be updated a little more as we have ongoing discussions with FERC. That's basically the end of my presentation. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and then I'm gonna give you one final takeaway message. Um, so a lot of people will say, well, if you're fixing the Anderson Dam, you know, you're, you're putting in the tunnel or you're fixing the spillway, why do we need to do the Coyote Creek Flood Protection Project? And the answer is Anderson Dam is its own unique issue that needs to be solved. It's a seismic issue and even if we upgrade the spillway, that means we transfer more water downstream. When we put in the tunnel, that means we better um, control the elevation of the reservoir, but it's discharging more water into the creek. So those are not fixes for the Coyote Creek flood protection measures. In order to get that 25 year level of service, you need to do the Coyote Creek flood protection project and that will keep you safe from a 2017 event. Um, so just, please don't get um, the impression that just because we're doing this project, we've solved all of the Coyote Creek issues because we haven't. And that's why we're coming out to you today to give you the update on what the status of the Coyote Creek flood protection project is. That's my presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. I just want to remind uh, members of the public, um, keep track of your questions following our next presentation. We will open the floor to allow you the opportunity to pose your question either in writing or verbally. I did want to apologize to Director Luzat. Um, I mispronounced um, the director's name. Thanks so much for your patience. Um, and also to remind members of the public participating in this meeting, we have 30 members of the public on the um, Zoom webinar, and then we have five joining through Facebook. So thanks again, Chris, for that informative question. And then also closing, providing some context as it relates to you know, what, what this really means. Next, I'd like to turn the meeting over to Damaris Villalobos-Galindo, the project manager 
for the Coyote Creek Flood Protection Project. And she'll be joined by Alex Nicholas, uh, the Capital Engineering Manager, um, and they will tag team the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. I'm gonna start sharing my screen now. Um, hey, just give me a minute. Christine, or uh, can you guys, can the uh, staff see my screen? Uh, Naya Demarie. Yes, you can see it? I cannot, you have to probably get the share. Oh, okay, sorry, let me see. Share. Okay, can you see it now? We, we can see it now, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Let me close this. Okay, thank you very much, Christine, again. And uh, before I start, uh, I wanna acknowledge the presence in the virtual audience of Yves Zuri. Uh, he's our partner at the City of San Jose for the Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services. He's been working with us since the beginning of the planning phase of this project. So again, my name is Amaris Villalobos Galindo, and I am the project manager for the planning phase of the Coyote Creek Flood Protection Project. And today I'm gonna talk about the preferred project alternative and I'll tell you what that means in the next couple of slides. Now, before I delve into the details of the project, I wanted to, uh, for us to get our bearings into where we are in the Coyote Creek Flood Protection Project. There are so many moving parts with this project that sometimes uh, we don't know exactly where we are. You know, the public asks me this question all the time. So I wanted to share this with you uh, to basically let you know where we are in the project. In this column here, you'll see the major phases of the project. And then within each phase, we have various components. Uh, if you have joined the past meetings in spring of 2019 and fall 2019, uh, you probably heard me talk about problem definition, conceptual alternatives, and feasible alternatives. Now at this point, if you have not been able to join those meetings, those meetings are also, uh, they were recorded and they are in our, in our project website in case uh, you wanna go back and check them or, or just you know, listen to them for the first time. So right now we're at the very, uh, we're doing the very last component of the planning phase of the project. Uh, we are at the very end, uh, beginning design and permitting in the next couple of months. So that is where we are, uh, design and permitting. And I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more. It's being split into two. Uh, due to what uh, Chris Hayes was talking about, the FERC order compliance project versus the elements that are not included in the order, FERC order compliance project. But uh, I have indicated in here uh, approximately the length of time that the design and permitting is gonna take for those two elements and then construction that for the FERC order compliance project elements needs to be completed by the end of 2023. And for the non-FERC order compliance project needs to be finished by 2025. Okay, what am I gonna talk about today? So today I'm gonna give a very brief overview of past meetings and what we have accomplished. I'm gonna give a list of all those feasible alternatives that uh, the public uh, help us develop and shape. And then I'm gonna explain how did we get from having a list of feasible alternatives into selecting a preferred project alternative via the natural flood protection process. Then I'm gonna talk about the phasing of the project elements. There are some elements, again, that are gonna be prioritized and then I'm gonna again talk about the project timeline where I'll introduce our design team and the design team is gonna talk about the next steps and what you can expect in the next weeks, months, and the next couple of years. What have we accomplished uh, in the past uh, during the planning phase? Uh, so if you remember uh, spring 2019, uh, we held meetings and I explained the conceptual alternatives, very rough alternatives and you, uh, the public provided input. So we took your input and refined our conceptual alternatives and developed feasible alternatives. Back in fall 2019, which seems like a long time ago now, due to everything that's happening right now, you also provided input on the feasible alternatives. And we're taking this input as well as the natural flood protection process that I'll explain in a minute, and we've developed the preferred project. So at one point, we need to have a preferred project alternative so that we can move that into design and then construction. And we're getting input right now in your comments. Now, before I get into the details on what this means and what the preferred project alternative looks like, I just wanna remind you uh, the project scope, how long it is. 
the project scope, the entire length is nine miles and it goes from Montague Expressway all the way to Tully Road. It's all located within the city of San Jose and on its way, it touches various um, important facilities, parks, uh, Watson Park, William Street Park, Selma all in there. It touches major roads and highways like Highway 880, Highway 101 and Highway 280. So because it's so long, we've split the, the project into five different areas or what we call riches. So whenever you hear me say rich, I'm talking about, about a specific area. So rich four starts at Montague Expressway and ends on, at o Old Oakland Road. And rich five starts at Old Oakland Road and ends on Mayberry Road uh, and so on and so forth. Right now, I'm just gonna focus on these two riches because this meeting is, is focused on Director Santos's district. Tomorrow's meeting is gonna be focusing on Director Esther Meras's district, which is which eight, and the June 17th meeting is gonna be focusing on the project elements uh, within which six and which seven. Now, the project alternatives that I'm gonna explain in a minute are project alternatives for the entire scope of the project, not only for specific elements. And I'll, mention, I'll explain that in a minute. So as I mentioned, the project is divided into areas or riches. And in the past set of meetings, together uh, the public and staff, as well as stakeholders, uh, have uh, developed different uh, options for each of these areas or riches. These uh, are what I like to call flood risk reduction options. For reach four, we developed two options and I'll go over those. I'll show you maps of what they are. For reach five, we develop one. For reach six, we develop one. For reach seven, we develop five options, and for reach eight, we develop one option. So what does it mean to have a set of feasible alternatives? So basically, an alternative, a project alternative, is a combination of all of those uh, options that we have for each of those areas. Alternative one, alternative two, basically is a different combination where we're replacing 7A by 7B. Alternative three, we're replacing these two by 7C, and so on and so forth. So then, as you can see, in the previous set of uh, alternatives, we were selecting 4A and now we're selecting 4B. So we have a total of 10 project alternatives and I'll explain what those are. And then we always, always include the no project alternative because the no project in some cases, only some cases, not specifically for this project, might be better than actually doing something. So how does 4A, let me go back, how does 4A, 4B, and 5A look like? So I'm gonna go over 4A. And some of you might have seen this map before in my last set of meetings. So for Reach 4 specifically, which goes from Montague Expressway to Old Oakland Road, as you know, the, the project objective is to reduce the risk of flooding um, from a flood event uh, similar to the 2017 flood event. And in our analysis, we found out that the main area that gets flooded within this reach is the area around Charcot Avenue. Uh, together since, spr since spring 2019 and fall 2019, we developed various alternatives for this area to reduce the risk of flooding. One of those options is for A. Uh, orange means a flood wall and purple means a head wall. So what we're proposing here is to have flood walls upstream and downstream from Charcot Avenue and head walls at the bridge. How do they look like? What do they mean? So a head wall is basically a wall on the, both upstream and downstream faces of the bridge. If, if some of you are familiar with this area, the Charcot Avenue doesn't look like this. Uh, currently, there is a railing in here and there are uh, holes in the railing. So during 2017, water went up and then it went over the bridge. It went through those holes and then it flooded the street and it flooded areas east and west of Charcot Avenue. So what we're proposing in option 4A is to have a head wall and a flood wall. So then water would go up to the level of 2017 and then it would basically touch this uh, head wall and then it'll be forced to go under pressure and get out on the other side. So that's option 4A. Option 4B, uh, again, orange is flood wall and yellow is passive barrier. So the orange, you know, it's similar to the previous option. We have head walls upstream and downstream of Charcot Avenue Bridge. But then at the entrances of the bridge, we actually have passive barriers. And if you are interested in watching a video on, on how they work, 
what they look like uh, in our past set of meetings fall 2019 we posted a video of how they work they basically during the most of the year they are embedded within the pavement and once the floodwaters touch them they automatically with the buoyancy of the water would rise up basically what we're doing here is preventing water from going going into the east and side sides of the charcoal avenue bridge and just keeping it within the channel so those are options for a and for b for reach four now for reach five uh, this is the area that encompasses South Bay Mobile Home Park, as well as some industrial areas north of Berryessa Road and south of Berryessa Road. Uh, again, Floodwall is orange and Cyan is, uh, Cyan is raised levee. So we're proposing to raise this levee here. Right now, there's not even a levee. There is an embankment. So we're proposing to raise it. And then where we don't have any more room to have a levee, we're proposing to have tall flood walls, about nine feet tall approximately and then uh, up to Berryessa Road, and then continuing from Berryessa Road all the way to Maybury Road. In a short segment to protect Notting Hill Avenue in this area, it's about a two feet tall flood wall to protect these residential areas. Now, for how would they look like? And this is only a rendering. Actually, as we move into design, uh, the public is gonna have the opportunity to have input on how things are gonna actually look like. But the main idea is that we're gonna raise the levee. This is how it looks like right now. There is a, uh, the topography kind of goes down. So then water as it's coming in, it goes this way. For those of you that remember the 2017 flood event, and then it goes and floods this area and as well as uh, this area here in the mobile home park community. So what we're proposing is to have a new levee and then uh, contain all of the water within the creek. And then where we cannot have a levee anymore because of, of space, then we'll have a, a flood wall. How would the flood wall look like? We still don't know. We are gonna get your input for that as we move into design, but this is just one idea of a project that we are already doing right now. Now, how do we go from having a plan and a feasible alternative and going into the preferred project? So we apply what we call Valley Water Board Policy, Natural Flood Protection Framework. What is this? So natural flood protection framework, it's a, again a Valley Water Board policy that looks to balance environmental quality, community benefit, and protection from flooding in a cost-effective manner, considering the physical, hydrologic, and ecological functions and processes of a creek. So what does this mean? It means that this process, this framework mandated by Valley Water, the Valley Water Board, it's looking at the least environmentally damaging practical alternative. And the way it does this, uh, in 2003, there was a, a very large group of technical experts, both internally and externally, both within Valley Water and outside, that developed uh, this set of, of this framework to guide project teams into selecting the least environmentally damaging practical alternative. What does that mean for us? So we have all of our project alternatives. I've explained 4A, 4B, and 5A. We also have estimated project costs, which are indicated in the black boxes. They range between $72 million and $92 million. And we also have the estimated uh, maintenance costs annually from $1.2 million to $1.3 million. We apply the NFP framework. It's a very long process. Uh, if you're interested afterwards, uh, you can ask me about it. Uh, it took us about three months to go through that process. And then we select a preferred project alternative. Now this framework is a qualitative uh, um, uh, process. So uh, we have two kind of highest rated options. We have alternative seven and alternative 10. For the specific area we're focusing on right now today, uh, reaches four and five, it doesn't make a difference because the same uh, option for both reaches is selected. 4B and 5A, and I'll show you what these are. So basically for reach four or area four, if you prefer that term, this is the preferred element within reach four, the flood walls and the passive barrier. Within reach five, we only had one option. So we're gonna have uh, the raising the levee here and flood walls all along this side of the industrial area. 
Now, that concludes the portion that talks about the preferred project alternative that focuses on the specific area um, uh, I'm talking about today. And now, I would like to move on and talk about the FERC order compliance uh, flood management measures for Coyote Creek. So just reiterating what Chris was saying, on February 20th, 2020, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission sent a letter to Valley Water that directed Valley Water to start lowering Anderson, De Anderson Dam to debt pool no later than October 1st. Now FERC also directed Valley Water to expedite implementation of the diversion tunnel system, Anderson Dam Tunnel Project. Now this tunnel system is scheduled to complete constru construction by December 2023. And it's designed, as Chris mentioned, for a maximum discharge of 2,000 CFS cubic feet per second, plus additional contribution from existing outlet, approximately 500 cubic feet per second, as well as additional contribution from tributary flows. Now, the Anderson Dam Tunnel Project, the team asked us to identify areas within Coyote Creek where flooding would occur as a result of implementing the FERC order. The Coyote Creek uh, Flood Protection Project planning, uh, planning team found out that completion of some elements of the ongoing project are necessary as avoidance and minimization measures for the ADTP to prevent flooding within urbanized areas. Now, what areas are these? I'm gonna focus on Ridge 5 for Area 5. There are various areas within Ridge 5. In fact, most of Ridge 5 has flows that are below that have a, an actual creek capacity below those flows that are anticipated to be seen uh, during the ADTP, the Anderson Dam Tunnel Project emergency operation, which is going to happen after December 2023, once the tunnel is constructed. So we identify those flows that we are um, uh, that we're going to see, and then those areas where the existing creek capacity is below. Uh, this threshold number. For Ridge 5, all of the areas uh, have existing creep capacities that are below that Anderson Dam Tunnel Project anticipated uh, discharges. So then Ridge 5, the entire Ridge 5, is going to be prioritized and needs to be completed by December 2023. Now, that doesn't mean that Ridge 4 is not going to get completed. It only means that is the this portion is going to get completed uh, prior to uh, Ridge 4. Now, uh, the December 2023, uh, it actually doesn't put us behind what we were already anticipated. I, I like to call it a super expedited project because the project was already expedited. So it only means that we have to expedite uh, what we're doing even further. Again, uh, where are we? We're, we are here at the end of the planning process. And right now, I would like to take this moment to introduce uh, one of my bosses, uh, Alec Nicholas. Uh, he's the capital engineering manager for one of the design and construction units. Uh, Alec? Thank you very much, Dummers. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alec Nicholas. And as this project will be wrapping up in the planning phase, we'll be transitioning into the design and permitting phase. As has been previously discussed by Chris and Damaris, there will be two aspects for the design phase and the construction phase of the Coyote Creek flood protection measures or for the flood protection project. Some of them will be part of mitigation measures for the FERC order compliance project as shown on the first row in blue and the remaining elements of the Coyote Creek flood protection project will be constructed in the schedule shown on the second bar design and construction. Now, there are two main milestones that these elements need to be constructed by. The first, the FERC order compliance project elements uh, in Coyote Creek will need to be constructed by December 2023, which is the end of the Anderson Dam Tunnel Project construction. And that's when the flows from Anderson Dam Tunnel Project will be coming down Coyote Creek. The second aspect of the Coyote Creek uh, elements will need to be constructed and in place by fall of 2025 which is when the high level tunnel will be completed as part of the site preparation for the construction of the Anderson Dam Seismic Retrofit Project. As Damaris mentioned, the planning phase is wrapping up currently. The couple elements, the uh, planning study report will be completed shortly. The Valley Water Board will be reviewing the engineer's report and the CEQA exemption for the FOCP project on the June 23rd board meeting date. 
the project will then be transitioning into the design team and the design phase of the project. And this design phase has a couple of elements. The first two that will be coming up shortly are the preliminary design as well as the real estate work and utility coordination. These items include such thing as collecting project data for the survey, geotechnical uh, engineering borings, utility uh, information, reviewing existing right of way information, developing design criteria, procuring an external design consultant, and selecting design alternatives, as well as uh, beginning negotiations with property owners after the Valley Water Board approves the engineer's report, acquiring any necessary easements and coordinating with utilities as well as municipalities. Moving into the remaining aspects of the design phase, there will be environmental permitting, and final design, as well as advertising for construction. Now, there are several other sub, uh, subtasks for the design phase, but during all of this design phase, we'll be coordinating and continuing to meet with the public to update the public on the current project status, as well as solicit public input on various design elements, such as aesthetics, signage, open space elements, public art, and such so forth. At this time, I would like to introduce our design team and our uh, main points of contact. Again, my name is Alex Nichols. I'm the capital engineering manager for the, the design unit. The main point of contact on the design side uh, will be Latina Nishijima, the project manager, as well as Jose Villarreal, the public information representative. And good news for everyone who's already familiar with Damaris, she will be transitioning from the planning phase to the design phase and will be assisting us as an assistant project manager. At this time, I'd like to take a few moments to allow Latina and Jose to introduce themselves and say a few words. Latina. Hi, thank you, Alec. Uh, as Alec mentioned, my name is Latina Nishijima. <clears throat> I've worked for the Water District for 20 years and I'm looking forward to working on this project. And Jose. Good evening, everyone. Uh, looking forward to, co to continuing to work on this project. Um, I'll like put my contact information up there. So any questions, any comments or anything uh, you might need from us, uh, feel free to contact me and, and uh, we're, here, we're here to serve you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose and Latina. And with that, I would like to give it back to Christine. Great, thank you very much, Alec and Damaris. Really appreciate that. Let me get this. Thanks for your patience. Great. All right. So um, we've come to the point in the meeting where we want to hear from you questions from the public. And uh, just just to review um, the the process that we're going to use is we hope to alternate between um, verbally submitted questions and written questions. And um, you can submit your questions through the Q&A portal. You can virtually raise your hand. And, I, and as I mentioned earlier in the meeting, we have staff available to respond to those questions. And again, for those folks that are viewing on Facebook, if, if you have questions, submit them and Valley Water staff will submit it through the, the Q&A portal. And just a reminder, the tonight's um, you know discussion topics, the update on the Anderson Dam seismic retrofit project, and Coyote Creek flood protection recommended alternatives. We hope to hear questions related to these um, the, these presentations. Um, you're certainly welcome to submit other questions, and Valley Water is anxious to respond to any of your inquiries. Um, but we certainly will prioritize those that um, are focused on, on tonight's presentation. And again, the ground rules. Um, listen with an open mind, submit your questions to participate, be curious, assume good intent, and um, using productive, respectful language. I see we already have three questions in the portal, so that's really exciting. Um, and they and they look like they are brief, so they certainly follow the instructions to provide an opportunity for as many of the folks that are participating tonight um, to join. And then again, if if there are questions related to to litigation, um, 
please work closely with your respective um, legal counsel or attorney. So with that, um, let's open the floor. I'm gonna um, open the Q&A portal here. It looks like um, our, um, our first question is from Facebook. And um, the question is, people in Morgan Hill want to know the impact of the Anderson Project on wildlife. And I guess for that, I'm going to uh, turn it back to um, to Chris Hakes, um, one of the deputy um, operating officers. Thank you, Christine. Uh, so the impacts on wildlife aren't uh, fully known at this point. Uh, the Anderson Project has two components, which you've heard about. The FERC Order Compliance Project, which has a draining of the reservoir, and then the Global Anderson Project, uh, the Seismic Retrofit Project. Right now, we're talking to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife, as well as the National Marine Fish Fisheries Service on what the acceptable impacts might be. Uh, we're looking at different measures to minimize the impact, um, basically keeping the creek wet downstream of Anderson Dam, either through bypass flows from Coyote Dam or imported water from our um, Central Valley Pipeline, or excuse me, Cross Valley Pipeline. Um, so we're trying to minimize the impacts to the species as much as possible. There are some non-native species that will be impacted that currently reside in the reservoir. Bass would be a prime example. As we actually dewater the reservoir, we, there will be opportunities to save native fish. Uh, the non-native fish might be fished. Uh, we're talking to CDFW about that, about whether that would be a suitable use to get rid of the non-natives, uh, sport fishing, if you will. Um, so, can't give you an exact, exact answer, but we are working on that right now and we hope to minimize any impacts. Thank you for that response. Uh, the next question is, um, why are we waiting until October 2020 to begin releasing water? So I think Chris, that, that goes back to you again. It does. Um, so Valley Water uh, believes that the reservoir restriction level of 592 feet is appropriate to keep uh, the residents downstream safe. Along with our winter operations where we typically lower the reservoir below that, we feel that gives us sufficient buffer um, to take any high flows that may come into the reservoir. However, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is very conservative. So they wanna go down to the 488, but they realize that there's a water supply impact, right? If we take the uh, reservoir all the way down to Deadpool right now in the middle of summer, that um, eliminates a pool of water that can be used for recharge, environmental benefit, and just drinking water to our treatment plants. So what they're concerned about is whether we're going to um, exceed the restricted level in winter. Um, basically, the rainy season starts about October, generally speaking, October 15th or so. So what they're saying is, as October starts, we want you to start draining the reservoir so you have extra capacity to buffer any incoming flows. If it turns out it's a very dry year, then we'll probably drain the reservoir rather quickly. Um, and uh, the conservative nature of FERC, um, I wouldn't say it's wasted, but basically, you know, we won't have that large storm that they had uh, kind of um, buffered against. If it's a wet winter, it may take us longer to drain. And, and then, you know, um, we'll have at least produced the extra capacity to buffer those flows. Thanks, Chris. That was a really thorough response. And um, it, it's useful um, that you, you shared those variables as well. Um, our next question uh, reads, you have used a 25-year flood model. How does this differ from the 100-year flood model? And I believe um, to respond to this question, we'd like to invite um, Director Barbara Keegan um, to answer the question. Director Keegan? I can mute. Let me unmute myself. Can you hear me now? We sure can. Thank you. So the difference between a 25 year and 100 year flood event has to do with the probability of the flood occurring within a particular period of time. So we're providing uh, protection in this case for the 25 year flood. Part of um, the challenge that we've faced in the past is looking at extremely providing, you know, a very high level of protection but with that level of protection, um, not being able to necessarily fund it through local funding sources. And also um, the 100 year flood project may require uh, less environmentally sensitive options 
in terms of um, increased use of flood walls and things of that nature. Um, I leave it up to staff if there's anything that they'd like to add to that. Um, Christine? Yeah, I was just gonna turn it over to Damaris Villalobos Galindo, the project manager. Thanks, Damaris, for jumping in. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, Director Keegan. I just wanted to add on to that, that the, the model we're using, the actual geometry is the same. The flows are the things that changes. So for the, the model that we're using, we are assuming um, a flow coming out of uh, Anderson Dam of approximately 7,400 cubic feet per second, which is approximately the discharge that was coming um, during the uh, flood event of 2017. And a 100 year flood event would assume an approximately 12,000 cubic feet per second coming out of Anderson Dam or coming from upstream. Just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Our next question reads, uh, we are storing less water, is that so? We can have more capacity for peak events. And I think this goes back to you, Chris Hakes, Deputy Operating Officer. Correct, so that is the theory that FERC is uh, operating under, is if we are draining the reservoir to a lower level, any significant flow that comes in may be detained um, in order to uh, prevent release um, past you know, the dam into Coyote Creek, or that it will basically have enough buffer that we won't exceed the restricted level. In FERC's eyes, the real issue would be is if we get heavy flows, retain that water, we're above the restricted level, and then we have a seismic event. That's the worst case scenario in FERC's eyes. So lowering that down to Deadpool gives us additional space. Great, thanks. The next question reads, are any flood control measures needed from Tully South to Anderson? Um, Damaris, um, as, as the project manager for the Coyote Creek Flood Protection Project, is that something that, that you can um, respond to, please? Yeah, um, I would like to defer this question to Afshin Rouhani, um, the uh, unit manager for uh, the um, planning group. Great. Af yeah, Afshin, Afshin Rouhani is the water policy and planning manager. Afshin, can you uh, join the conversation and respond to this question, please. Uh, can you hear me, Christine? We sure can. Oh, great. Nice to hear um, you. Um, yeah, there's, so to answer the question, there's a lot of uh, areas actually south of, um, south of Tully that are subject to flooding, but most of these areas are parks or undeveloped land. So, uh, there, there are no urban areas that are at risk of flooding in the flows that we're talking about, you know, at these low flows. Great. Thank you very much. I'm glad that you're with us tonight. I can't see you right now, but it's good to hear your voice. Um, our next question, um, um, I'm, I'm going to send this back to you, um, Chris Hakes. The question is, how important is the reservoir to drinking water resources? Um, so I am going to vastly oversimplify the answer to this because uh, you know we have a whole water supply division that would tell you the ins and outs. But basically what, it, what Anderson does is twofold. It allows us to preserve water quality in our treatment plants. So basically we get water from the San Luis Reservoir, we blend it with the local Anderson water that helps to offset taste and odor issues. So basically, it's not like we need Anderson only to supply the drinking water to our treatment plants, but we do use it to help blend. What it really does in its primary purpose, and it's the primary purpose of all 10 of our reservoirs, is recharge our groundwater basin. Right now, our basin is completely full. We're in good shape, uh, even without Anderson, to basically have a full basin that will serve our community as necessary. The longer Anderson's out, what it does is it takes a layer of reliability away from us. Our water supply portfolio is very diverse. We have about 50, let me see, 55 percent of imported water comes into the county. Um, and so, you know, we have that supply that's coming in. We use our groundwater basin, uh, but when a drought happens, all of our different sources start to get a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller, right? So in that case, uh, Anderson is, I would say, uh, completely unimportant and possibly the most vital thing we have. It's a very weird answer to say, 
but it's just what you're looking at. Um, ideally, we need to fix Anderson so we have the full recharge capacity of 90,000 acre feet, um, and that will help to keep our portfolio resilient and reliable. Great, thank you very much. This next question is for uh, Alec Nicholas, uh, the capital engineering manager, and, and he was just introduced as part of the, the design team by um, Don Maurice. But before I raise the question, I just wanna remind folks if, if they would like to participate and present their question verbally, they're welcome to raise their virtual hand and we will bring them into the meeting. So, um, Alec, this is the question. Uh, my properties are marked for acquisition or raising them ab above the flood level. I have tenants in my properties. How do you handle these cases for both scenarios? Maybe you can speak a little bit about the, the design phase and some of those next steps. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, as we had discussed previously in the presentation, right now we're wrapping up the planning phase of the project. And since we are just at the end of the planning phase, Valley Water is not making uh, any commitments as to any of the individual parcels of property. Uh, any need for the properties would be determined by a final project approval by the board of directors. And I would also recommend and refer the individual to question number 17 on the FAQs on the Coyote Creek website. Great, thank you very much. Um, this next question is related to um, water quality, uh, riparian health. What are the measures uh, to ensure that the riparian and stream health in the lower stretches of Coyote Creek are maintained? Damaris, is that, is that a question you can help uh, provide a response to as it relates to um, the, the flood protection plan and how, how ensuring um, the plan meets um, Valley Water's environmental uh, protection and preservation priorities? Yeah, um, I would like to uh, refer the question to our environmental planner, Jennifer Nicholson. Jennifer Nicholson, can you join the conversation? Yes. Um, the plan currently for the lower reaches of the Coyote Creek are that we're, we're, the flood walls will be outside of the riparian area. They're on the edges of the roads and up outside of the um, ordinary high water mark. So the plan will not be to remove any trees or, um, or any vegetation within the channel for this project. Okay, thanks Jennifer. I see one, it, it's not the next in the queue, but it's related to invasive species. Um, will invasive plant species be removed from both creek banks and reach five as they have contributed to flooding South Bay in 2017? As I understand, the project, there is no vegetation removal in part of the planning for this project. But there may be some mitigation that comes as part of the um, negotiations with regulatory agencies. But um, at this point, we haven't negotiated those mitigations yet. Okay, thanks. Let's see. I'm just, we've got a couple of questions that are, that are similar. So we're gonna move forward here. Um, so the individual expressed, um, this is a little unrelated, but will you continue to regulate downstream riparian habitats that are currently significantly impacting the stream community health? Um, in particular related to urban inputs and the homeless encampments along the banks. Now I know um, Sue Tippett's the Deputy Operating Officer of the Watershed Operations and Maintenance Division um, has had a hand in, in some of this. Sue, would you like to respond to this question? Sure, I can respond to that. Um, th this 
particular project won't be really be doing anything to, um, in, for this um, particular interest. However, we continue to uh, work with the city of San Jose to clean up homeless encampments along the, um, the creek banks. Um, and this can be in areas where the, either the city or water district, um, Valley Water owns property. There are other areas that are um, owned by other entities that we don't have the ability to um, access, but we do continue to work with the city for, to do what we can in those areas. Great, thanks Sue. Mm -hmm. um, here's a really interesting question and it, it relates to collaboration with other governing units. Um, and it reads, our urban environment, rooftops and hard surfaces does not allow water and allow it to percolate into this, does not slow water, excuse me, and allow it to percolate into the soil. What opportunities are there for water catchment on roofs, et cetera? How is the district working on this issue? And how, um, I think it's how impact this project, how would it impact this project, if at all? I can, I can an, try to answer this question, Christine. Can you hear me? I sure can. Okay, ahead, okay very good. So this particular project is now looking into stormwater management, part of uh, you know, the, the uh, BMP's best management practices for urban environments. But we do have, we are working uh, in conjunction whenever we have the opportunity or we see there is an opportunity to partner with somebody on, on um, uh, on this aspect, we do. For example, we are working right now with the City of San Jose, uh, coordinating on the very ESA Urban Village Plan. Uh, this is a big project that is going to happen in the next couple of years, and we are working with them uh, and revising some of the documents that they have and how they are trying to implement green infrastructure within their uh, within their new development that they are planning. Because we understand that the health of the Uber environment, especially adjacent to Creative Creek, affects uh, directly you know, the health of the creek. So again, this project is not as specifically looking at that, but whenever we can work with somebody else and encourage them or, or work with them in partnership with them uh, to make uh, our new infrastructure more green, uh, then we, we do it. We encourage it. I used to uh, work in stormwater, so I'm very passionate about that subject too. <laughs> yes, yes, that's that is definitely clear from your presentation and, and the commitment to this project, Damaris. The other question that's for you, um, Damaris, is um, we've got an individual that's expressed interest in where could they locate or view a video that demonstrates the passive flood walls and how they work? Sure. Yeah, if they go to the project website, uh, the meetings uh, from November of 2019, it seems like a long time ago, but uh, November 2019, uh, and they go through the presentation, there is one of the slides that has the link to the video. Uh, however, if they, wanna, if they don't wanna be like searching into the website, they can also email uh, Lotina, who's our main point of contact, and she can uh, um, you know, always send you the link directly. Great, and the website again is www.valleywater.org backslash coyote hyphen creek um, for that information. Okay, super. Uh, the next question is, um, is there a portion of the project that focuses on creek cleanup before the water is released? So I think Chris, um, maybe you can respond uh, to that question. And then if, if others want to join, they certainly can. So um, as part of the uh, project on the FLCP, we will be restoring a portion of the creek that is um, what we call the historical channel, um, just downstream of Anderson Dam. Uh, that's not really a creek cleanup as much, much as it is a creek restoration. However, that said, we will be going downstream to look at possible impediments from an environmental perspective. Um, the issue becomes, you know, creek cleanup, we think of perhaps removing homeless encampments, and w this project's not authorized to do that. Uh, we will look at natural impediments or unnatural impediments that have been deposited in the creek um, as part of the restoration of habitat. Great, thanks. I think we're going to invite um, our, uh, our environmental plan. Oh, okay. I guess we've eliminated that question. Excuse me. 
Uh, well, I guess we will invite Jennifer. Uh, there was a, the, our, the environmental planner. We, we, we had a question and it disappeared, but now we have a new question related to um, federally protected species. Can you tell us what federally protected species will be impacted and or monitored? Um, we can start with Coyote Creek, but um, we may also want to talk about Anderson Dam. Um, this question isn't specific. So um, what, if Jennifer is available, if she would like to, to speak to that, and then yep. um, we can turn it over to Chris Hakes again to talk about Anderson Dam. Uh, Coyote Creek is a steelhead creek, and um, but the design of this, of this project so far has been that we will not be doing any construction in the stream bed or within the high water mark within the banks. So we're not anticipating any impacts to um, fish or aquatic organisms. Um, and with regard to upland species, uh, I, 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 there aren't any that I'm aware of that are going to be impacted that are within the, the reaches on this project. So we'll be putting walls in, in areas where existing fences and, um, and existing infrastructure are already there, so there shouldn't be any um, endangered species that are uh, impacted by it, this project in the urban areas. Thank you. Me for any disturbance from the background my kid was making, was knocking on the door. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, Chris, would you like to respond as well? Sure, so as uh, Jen mentioned, the protected species from a federal perspective is steelhead, and that is downstream of Anderson. Uh, upstream of Anderson, we don't have the steelhead present because they can't actually get out to the ocean to migrate back and forth. Um, upstream of Anderson Dam, the rainbow trout. So they're not a federally protected species. Um, I believe the, the question was tailored towards ESA requirements, um, which basically, you know, uh, um, there, there's a very fine detail because there are bald and golden eagles possibly in the area. They're not endangered species, um, but they are federally, uh, they have what they call the Eagle Act. So they have their own act. Um, they do nest in the general area. However, um, we'll do an eagle survey as well as get a permit um, just in case uh, that we uh, impact them. And we won't be directly impacting them, but what we might be doing is altering their food source for a bit. So if Anderson's dry, if they use it um, as a place to a hunting ground, that would be unavailable to them. But generally speaking, the only ESA protected species is steelhead. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I, I'd like to bring um, Sue Tippett's the Deputy uh, Operating Officer for Watershed Operations and, and Maintenance. Um, Sue, you may wanna bring in a, some other individuals, but the question from the member of the public uh, reads, is there a portion of the project that focuses on creek cleanup before the water is released? Um, and I, I'm sending it off to you as, as kind of a standard maintenance question. There may be some other um, project prep um, that's tied to the actual, actual construction that we can share with, a, with another one of your team members at Valley Water. Would you like to start, Sue? Sure, yeah, um, I don't believe that the project itself has any um, element of it that would be focusing on creek cleanup. As was mentioned, it, um, it doesn't really um, touch too much of the creek um, itself. However, um, we do have, as I mentioned before, a number of our um, encampment cleanups. And um, actually um, in December, um, Director Santos had spearheaded a um, creek cleanup along Coyote um, that was to occur. And that was postponed because we had rain to April and then was postponed again because we had COVID. So um, I'm confident that that will probably um, be occur again um, later on when we can all get into the creek and do a, a pretty good sized um, cleanup event. So um, we will be continuing on with our, our creek cleanups. Thank you very much. It sounds like that's been really challenging for you and your team as well. It's cer it certainly is not easy. Um, these uncertain times. So thanks. Um, this question, I'm going to send it back to Chris Hakes, the Deputy Operating Officer, um, and it's from one of our viewers on Facebook, and it reads, there was, a, there was an earlier concern that Anderson would be drained and abandoned altogether. Can you reassure the public that 
it won't be abandoned. I guess we can assume that that's not in parentheses, but I, I think that's the um, substance of the question. Uh, I absolutely can assure the public that there are no plans to abandon Anderson at this point. Um, the decommissioning process for a dam is actually more costly and more time consuming and has more environmental impact than the retrofit itself. Um, that is why we are moving along with both the tunnel project and the Anderson Dam size retrofit project. Um, that's the way to balance both environmental protection, uh, water supply, and dam safety. Um, so no plans to decommission and abandon the dam. Great, thank you very much. Um, I, I, we haven't received uh, any virtually raised hands and verbal questions, but we still encourage you if you, if you would like to do so, um, you're welcome to join the meeting that way. But um, I, I wanna thank the public um, for being so engaged and continuing to provide questions. We, we have a number that are in queue right now, so I'll continue to uh, read these and then um, uh, dispatch them to the team. Will parts of the Coyote Creek Parkway be closed during construction? So, um, Damaris Villalobos Galindo, the project manager for the flood protection project, do you want to answer this one? Sure. Uh, as mentioned in our presentation, uh, we are at the end of the planning phase of the project, uh, moving into design. And we haven't determined yet what areas are going to be uh, for um, yeah, entering and exiting areas of construction. So as we move uh, on with the design and construction, we're certainly going to let you know, uh, you know, keep you updated on which areas are going to be impacted during the construction of the project. Again, we are not there yet, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll keep you updated on this. Thank you. And the next question, um, Chris Hakes, uh, Deputy Operating Officer for Dam Safety and, and um, Capital uh, Delivery Division. I'm, I'm gonna share this with you. You, you may wanna include um, some other team members. But the question reads, are the rainbow trout and steelhead populations truly different populations or are the rainbow trout in the reservoir steelhead populations that were isolated by the construction of the dam? So, um that's a good question. And uh, I will say that Coyote Creek has been modified over the years so much that I couldn't tell you uh, what the distinct populations were. At this point, Anderson Dam has been in place for 70 years. So the populations are established as rainbow trout and steelhead because there has been no fish passage. Um, so, uh, you know, from a, I know it is a technical perspective, but the biologist told me uh, quite clearly that downstream we have protected steelhead and upstream we have rainbow trout. Um, they're actually looking at the genetics of both species right now to see if there's a link. Um, but like I said, it's been that way for 70 years. So um, they may have developed unique populations. Thank you very much. And uh, the next comment um, is, is, is that it's a comment. This seems like a well-planned project thus far. Thank you all for your good work. I would like to ask you to continue to hold the ecosystem health high in the list of priorities. And um, I, I wonder if, um, you know, Damaris, um, as, as the project manager for, for Coyote Creek, or um, Chris Hakes, um, your responsibility at Anderson Dam, if you, if there be value in sharing again, uh, that the board of directors policy direction related um, to environmental preservation, protection, et cetera, on both those projects, just to remind folks of that. Why don't we start with Damaris? Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure, no, when I first started working on this project, which is not too long ago, uh, that was the first direction that I got from my, from Afshin Rouhani, who's a unit manager for the um, watershed planning and policy team, to try to stay as far as possible from the creek uh, to try to have a minimal impact on the creatures within the creek because not only is this a better project, you know, in, in, in terms of, of getting, um, having less impact on the creatures within the creek, but also because it is, uh, everybody feels more comfortable, especially uh, regulatory agencies, you know, that we are thinking ahead from the beginning 
into having uh, not so, you know, to mitigate all the impacts from the planning phase and not have a project that uh, maybe in the future is gonna be hard for us to mitigate. We wanna prevent any, down, any uh, impacts, not, you know, try to prevent them instead of mitigate impacts. So yeah, I was just, that was the direction that I got from the beginning. Chris, would you like to share the policy direction on uh, Anderson Dam? Sure. Um, in a nutshell, the policy direction is get it done. I mean, we've looked at all the different alternatives that could possibly be in place. Um, no dam, smaller dam, notched dam with a, you know, kind of a, a fish pass through. Uh, and the Anderson Dam size retrofit really is, uh, as conceived now, the least impact, impactful project to the environment, um, most benefit to water supply, and you know the board of directors has made it a priority to get it done. Um, and the project started way back in 2012. It's expanded about three different times, um, you know, and that, that's a little bit frustrating to the residents, and we know that. Uh, but we're building on forward momentum. We've got a congressional delegation that is behind us, and the board is fully behind us as well. So they have said, go out there and get it done. Great. Um, so, um, related to Anderson Dam, um, is there, are there any plans for a fish pass-through? Would that ever be an option? Um, so, short answer is it won't be pass-through, uh, what they call volitional pass-through. Uh, you can't really make a tunnel. Uh, it doesn't really work. The fish need light. Uh, it's too big for a fish ladder. I think Anderson's about 210 feet, maybe 230 feet tall. Fish ladders are only effective probably less than 100 feet. We even looked into fish cannons, which kind of shoot the fish up, um, but even that has a cap of about 120 feet. Um, in order to get fish passage above the dam, uh, we're exploring what they would call trap and haul or trap and truck, where you actually have to physically capture the fish and move them past the dam. Uh, we'll continue to talk to our regulators about that, um, about whether that is something that is worthwhile, because there are some studies that say that doesn't really help the species. Um, so we're continually working with our regulators to find out what the um, required measures will be. Great, thank you. So the next question uh, is for Alec um, Nicholas, the capital engineering manager. And the member of the public posed the question this way, can someone speak to what a permanent easement involves? And do owners lose property is this part of the land acquisition plan? So thank you very much for the question. A permanent easement, uh, to simplify it a little bit, is essentially uh, to allow access for valley water inspection or maintenance crews to be able to access the specific element adjacent to a property like a, a flood wall to make sure that it is inspected and maintained uh, regularly. Um, as to the Second part of the question, again, uh, I would defer them to question 17 of the FAQs, uh, especially since we cannot make any commitments at this time to any of the provincial properties until the Valley Water has approved the final project. Great, thanks. So um, while we have a little pause from the public, we've gone through about 21 questions from the public and I, I don't see any new question. Oh, there we go. We do have a new question. I was going to jump into a, a couple others from the FAQ to review that are common, but um, this is to you. This is to you, Chris. Hakes, uh, Deputy Operating Officer. When Anderson Dam is rebuilt, will the capacity and maximum water level be different? So the capacity and maximum water level will be exactly the same. Uh, what will be different is the height of the dam crest. Uh, we will be adding about eight feet to the height of the crest, and that is not for additional water storage, um, but that is actually for what they call freeboard. Um, the, um, the Maurice has also talked about freeboard on several occasions. Basically, that's a little buffer that you have uh, just in case of emergency to make sure that you don't overtop the dam uh, or overtop the bank in terms of uh, what a flood protection project does. So although the crest will be higher, the water surface elevation and capacity should remain the same. Great. Thanks. Quick and to the point. We appreciate that, Chris. Thank you. Um, so um, a, a question that has come up in a number of the meetings that I've participated in, um, and um, I, I think Alec um, 
this may be a, a question to you, Alec Nicholas. How will berms, barriers, or flood walls be designed to not only work to provide flood protection, but also be aesthetically pleasing and fit within um, and complement, you know, the neighborhood character? No, that's a, that's a very good question. And as mentioned in one of the slides that I was discussing, during the whole design phase, we'll be regularly meeting with the public to solicit their input on what we are proposing, what the different design alternatives are to address these issues, you know, structurally, you know, what kind of a flood wall we're going to be proposing that works with the site conditions, and we'll be soliciting the public's input on aesthetic concerns and other concerns that they have with the specific project elements as we go along the design process. Great, thank you. Um, another question um, that is included on Valley Waters um, frequently asked questions list, but it, it does come up. Um, it has come up in a number of community meetings, so I, I'd like to share it just um, for, the, for the group's informational purposes. Does the Coyote Creek project need to be completed before work on and the Anderson Dam seismic retrofit project has started? Once Anderson Dam is rebuilt, will that address all the Coyote Creek flood risks? So Damaris, do you wanna kick that off? Yeah, I can start. I, I believe in his preamble, uh, Chris Hakes uh, mentioned this that even if uh, after uh, the Anderson Dam is built, uh, we're still, there are still various elements because we're gonna have these big tunnels that are gonna be able to release way more water than what can be released from Anderson Dam now. Right now we have a kind of like a straw in a big uh, swimming pool and we're gonna have now these big two tunnels releasing uh, water into Coyote Creek. So the Coyote Creek Flood Protection Project, the downstream elements need to happen in conjunction with uh, Anderson Dam. Um, yeah, the Anderson Dam alone is not gonna solve the issue downstream. Do you have anything to add, Chris, to that? Um, not really. I think uh, Damaris has uh, accurately captured it that, um, you know, the Anderson Dam project does not solve uh, the Coyote Creek Flood Protection issues. Um, after Anderson is complete, we've restored capacity, which allows us a bigger buffer, but you can still have a, a scenario where we activate our spillway, it's spilled 11 times since 1950, um, and that would mean you would have a large amount of water going down um, the creek. We will have a better outlet system, which will help us better control the reservoir level, but you know, you could still get a scenario in which Coyote Creek will have large flows going down, and that's why the project is required. Got it, got it, thank you very much. The, the next question is, um, do the lower lays of the reservoir become hypoxic during the summer months? I'm not sure if I completely understand that question, but maybe you do, Chris. Um, well, I understand, but uh, I do not know. I'm going to have to kick the biologist because um, I'm unsure what the function at the lower layers of the reservoir are uh, when the water heats up in summer. So I don't know if Jen might know. Jennifer, can you um, respond to that question? No, I, d I can't respond to that. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. So maybe that's one of those that will be included on the list and um, we can circle back with some type of response to the public and, and make that Christine, available. Christine, Vincent here. Yes. Um, I don't have um, the particular answer on the oxygen levels and the layers of the lake. Typically a layer does stratify. Uh, we do have monitoring, uh, water profile monitoring, including temperature and dissolved oxygen. I've not heard of a problem where the low oxygen levels have been a problem in this reservoir. Some of the other smaller reservoirs, we do have some problems. So we can definitely look into that and ask that question, but I've typically not heard problems with dissolved oxygen in Anderson Reservoir, but we will follow up on that. Great, um, thank you very much. That was Vincent Jin, Jin, the Deputy Operating Officer of Watershed Stewardship and Planning Division. Thank you very much for jumping in and answering that question. We really appreciate it. So um, can, the next question is, um, can Valley Water perform uh, vegetation and stream channel maintenance on private property, or can Valley Water force Creekside property owners to perform maintenance? And I'm wondering, Sue, if you can um, 
jump into the discussion and answer that question. Sue Tibbetts, Deputy Operating Officer of Watershed Operations in the Maintenance Division. Uh, yeah, no, we can't um, force people to um, do any work on their creeks. We don't have that kind of a police power or land use authority. That would be anything that could be done would be a city or a municipality um, function. And, and even that I couldn't answer you for sure. Okay, great, thanks. Um, our next question um, from um, a member participating in the meeting tonight. The question reads, where will imported water be stored when Anderson is dewatered? Will we have enough storage capacity? Chris sure. Haight, can you answer so that question? The bulk of our imported water comes into the San Luis Reservoir and resides there. We take it from San Luis and pump it down into Anderson in order to um, help preserve water quality and then recharge our groundwater basin. Uh, with Anderson offline, we won't have a local supply to do groundwater recharge, but we can still have that imported water bank out at San Luis Reservoir. Um, we also actually get imported water from the north of the county as well through our South Bay Aqueduct. So we have several places that we actually get imported water. The groundwater recharge facilities will still be operational. It's just that we won't have that local bank in Anderson. Great, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm just going to review another question from Valley Waters uh, um, FAQ frequently asked questions list because we don't have any questions right now from the public and we've got about four more minutes before we start wrapping up this meeting. But it's a question that I, that I have also heard at, at previous meetings. Which parts of the creek does Valley Water maintain and what can be done to maintain the other sections of Coyote Creek that are not under Valley Waters jurisdiction? So, this is Sue, I can answer that. <laughs> okay, um, and that's Sue Tippett, the um, Operating Officer of Watershed Operations in the Maintenance Division. Thanks, Sue. Yeah, so um, the, the Valley Water owns about a third of all of the streams within the county. Um, it's about 275 miles of the 800 or so that are in the kind of the valley floor urban areas. And um, on Coyote Creek, um, it's still about a third we own. Uh, lands up to about Montague Expressway and then upstream of that it's um, a lot of it is really owned by the city through the, um, the project area and private private property owners and then um, uh, south of Tully Road a lot of that is owned by the county and operated by county parks and so um, we are we can only do work where we have land rights um, we have made some arrangements in the past to assist the city of San Jose in some of the work on their property um, and the rest of it is really up to a private property owner. And following up on that last question that was posed um, regarding making or somehow um, requiring a property owner to maintain their property, there are laws that require uh, property owners to maintain their facilities or their property um, from public nuisance and that, that sort of thing. But to the extent that it, it, it means that they're supposed to take out um, you know, any particular thing, the, the law isn't really that clear on what that means. But, but certainly, you know, just as you have a responsibility as a property owner to maintain your front lawn, for instance, this, that would be the same kind of criteria that would apply to the creek. Great, thank you very much, Sue. Well, um, we've come to the close of the meeting. I, I just wanna confirm um, or ask, do, do any other meeting participants tonight um, have any remaining questions that they would like to submit in about the last minute or so? Uh, I'm, I'm gonna just check the chat feature. I don't see any popping up. Um, so thank you, um, thank you very much to, um, all of the community members that joined the meeting tonight. We know you have a lot of demands on your time and um, being again part of this um, meeting um, really helps Valley Water um, as it relates to understanding what the issues and interests are as they proceed with work on both these projects um, and you're a critical partner um, to the success of the implementation um, and execution of both these projects. And thank you very much staff for staying engaged and visible <laughs> through the meeting. It was really helpful. It's great to see your smiling faces. So with that, I wanted to wrap up um, and say thank you again for joining us. Um, remember, 
uh, Valley Water will host a two more meetings, one tomorrow night, uh, June 11th from six to eight, and a third session on June 17th from six to eight. Uh, and we also want to remind you again that the presentation of the engineer's report for Anderson Dam Federal, Emer Federal Energy Regulatory Commission order compliance project, which includes some elements of Coyote Creek will be presented to the board of directors at their next meeting on June 23rd. And you're welcome to join that discussion um, and hear that, hear that conversation. For more information on the Coyote Creek project, um, Feel free to visit www.valleywater.org backslash coyote hyphen creek. And this meeting recording, along with the meeting recording on the 11th and 17th, will all be posted at that website. You're welcome to explore project updates there. And we encourage you to complete a survey to provide feedback on your experience with this meeting tonight. Valley Water plans to continue to conduct these meetings and if there are things that you'd like to see improved or changed, um, I know that they're interested in hearing that information. To close the meeting, I'd like to invite Director Santos back to share some final comments. Director Santos? Yes, Christine, can you hear me okay? I sure can. Well, first of all, Christine, you are a four-star facilitator. Thank you so much, excellent job. I also want to say to all our presenters from our Valley Water, they just did a four-star job. And to the public, wonderful, wonderful questions. Very informative. So thank you to, the, thank you to all for coming to tonight's meeting on this um, Zoom meeting. I know it's difficult, but I really appreciate the participation. We have two more meetings as stated. One taking place tomorrow, June 11th at 6 o'clock with Director Tony Estramero, and the last one will be on June 17th. The Zoom meeting details are on our website in case you'd like to tune in to those as well. My board colleagues and I will be discussing some of the recommended alternatives at our June 23rd board meeting. It is virtual an evening meeting that will take place on Zoom st starting at 6 p.m. I hope you can join us. We will continue to provide updates, engage you, as the project moves into design phase. We are committed to be moving this project forward and getting this project built as quickly as possible. So to all of you, I wish everyone a good evening and please stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, good night.